Today's topic is the limitation on capital losses. I'm Leandra Letterman, and I'm really pleased to have a co-host today. I'm Emily Gobble, and it's time to break into tax. The U.S. federal income tax has both a limitation on capital losses and a capital gains preference for individuals. The topic of this video is the limitation on capital losses. As we work through this video, we're going to assume that you've correctly determined that you have capital gain or loss, and you've correctly determined whether you have long-term capital gain or loss or short-term capital gain or loss. If you're not sure how to make those determinations, we have another video that covers that topic. So here's what I always recommend as an initial setup, a two by two table with capital gains across the top and capital losses across the bottom. So you have long-term capital gain, short-term capital gain, long-term capital loss and short-term capital loss. And then code section 1H11 talks about qualified dividend income and that doesn't go in the grid, that goes off to the side because that's treated separately. It's not taken into account when dealing with the limitation on capital losses. I recommend that you first add the capital losses across the bottom and add the capital gains across the top. If the capital losses in the aggregate exceed the capital gains in the aggregate, you have a limitation on capital losses problem. And you have to look then to code section 1211. That also means that you will not have a net capital gain subject to the capital gains preference, except for any qualified dividend income that is defined as net capital gain in code section 1H11. So if your total capital losses are more than your total capital gains, Section 1211 becomes relevant and provides for the limitation on the deductibility of capital losses. In the case of a corporation, losses can only be deductible to the extent of capital gains. In the case of taxpayers other than a corporation, capital losses can be used against capital gains. And they can also be used against up to $3,000 of ordinary income. So what two tells us is that that $3,000 ordinary income offset is a maximum. But if the amount by which the capital losses exceed the capital gains is less than that, say it's only $2,000, then that's the amount of losses that are deductible from ordinary income, not the larger $3,000 amount. This concept of limiting the deductibility of losses to income or gain of a similar type is sometimes referred to as basketing. Let's turn to an example. So here I filled in the boxes on the grid. We have $6,000 of long-term capital gain, $4,000 of short-term capital gain, $15,000 of long-term capital loss, and $10,000 of short-term capital loss. So I recommend adding across the bottom, we see there's $25,000 of capital losses. Adding across the top, we see there's $10,000 of capital gains. So capital losses here exceed capital gains, raising a limitation on capital losses issue. So what will happen here is the capital losses of 25,000 are first deductible to the extent of the capital gains, and then $3,000 more can be offset against ordinary income. So the taxpayer here has $60,000 of ordinary income, and so that's ample to deduct a full $3,000 of the remaining capital losses. That means that in total, the taxpayer can deduct $13,000 of the capital losses this year. $12,000 of capital losses are disallowed by section 1211. And what happens to those? Well, they can be carried forward to the following year under code section 1212. So let's take a look at that. Section 1212 provides the rules regarding the carry forward of capital losses in the case of non-corporate taxpayers. In the case of corporations, 1212A contains some slightly different rules. We're going to focus on section 1212B. Section 1212B contains the rules for carrying forward capital losses in the case of taxpayers other than corporations. 
1212B1 does most of the work. It tells you how much capital loss is going to be carried forward and whether the capital loss that's carried forward will be short-term capital loss or long-term capital loss in the next year. To determine those amounts, Section 1212B1 uses various other terms like net short-term capital loss and net long-term capital gain. These terms are defined within Section 1222. One thing that factors in is the taxpayer's short-term capital gain in the current year. The work that's done by Section 1212B2 is essentially to say when you are determining each of these things, like net short-term capital loss, for instance, you deem the taxpayer to have some additional short-term capital gain. So they're treated like they have whatever short-term capital gain they actually had, plus short-term capital gain in an amount equal to any ordinary income that was offset by capital loss in the current year. So if the taxpayer had a $3,000 ordinary income offset in determining the long-term or short-term nature of the capital loss carry forward, that ordinary income offset is treated as short-term capital gain. So section 1212, makes use, as you saw, of a number of terms that involve netting capital gains and losses. Let's look at how those terms are defined. Net short-term capital gain means the excess of short-term capital gains for the taxable year over short-term capital losses. Net short-term capital loss is essentially the opposite. That means the excess of short-term capital losses for the taxable year over the short-term capital gains for the year. And then similarly, net long-term capital gain means the excess of long-term capital gains for the year over long-term capital losses. And conversely, net long-term capital loss means the excess of long-term capital losses for the year over the long-term capital gains for the year. Turning back to our example, we have a taxpayer who has total capital losses of $25,000 and total capital gains of $10,000. So their capital loss limitation came into play. They were able to use their capital losses against 10,000 of capital gain plus 3,000 of ordinary income. So they were able to deduct a total of 13,000. They weren't able to deduct 12,000. 12,000 of their capital loss gets carried forward. Section 1212B1 then tells them how much of that $12,000 that gets carried forward will be long-term capital loss in the next year and how much will be short-term capital loss in the next year. And the first step before you apply the language of Section 1212B1 is to keep in mind that they'll be treated as if they had an additional 3,000 of short-term capital gain. Because they could use 3,000 of their capital loss against 3,000 of ordinary income, they're deemed to have an additional $3,000 of short-term capital gain. So it will be as if they had $7,000 of short-term capital gain when applying Section 1212B1. The excess of the net short-term capital loss over the net long-term capital gain is what's a short-term capital loss in the next year. And the excess of the net long-term capital loss over the net short-term capital gain is what's a long-term capital loss in the next year. So to figure that out, you can actually subtract up the right column and down the left to get net short-term capital loss and net long-term capital gain. And then you can subtract up the left column and down the right to get net long-term capital loss and net short-term capital gain. The intuition here is that where your net short-term capital losses exceed sort of the opposite in gains, the net long-term capital gain, that's pointing you to which component of the losses is going to be short-term next year. And conversely, when your net long-term capital losses exceed essentially the opposite in gains, the net short-term capital gains, that's pointing you to what's going to be long-term capital loss in the next year. So turning to the, the concrete numbers in this problem, if we're going to figure out how much of their carry forward is short-term capital loss, we take the excess of net short-term capital loss 
again, that's subtracting up the right side over net long-term capital gain, subtracting down the left side. Up the right side, net short-term capital loss would be 3,000, the excess of 10,000 over seven. Down the left side, net long-term capital gain would be zero because long-term capital gain is not more than long-term capital loss at all. So then taking the net, the, the excess of net short-term capital loss, the 3,000 over zero, tells us that 3,000 of the carry forward is short-term capital loss. Turning now to figure out how much of the carry forward is long-term capital loss, we take the excess of net long-term capital loss, subtracting up the left side over net short-term capital gain, subtracting down the right side. Subtracting up the left side, the excess of 15,000 over 6,000 is 9,000. It's our net long-term capital loss. Going down the right side, the excess of 7,000 over 10,000 is zero. 7,000 doesn't exceed 10,000 at all. So then putting those two buckets together, the excess of net long-term capital loss, which is 9,000 over zero of net short-term capital gain, tells us that 9,000 is long-term capital loss. So 9,000 of the carry forward is long-term capital loss. So in sort of summary, there's 12,000 in total that gets carried forward. 3,000 of that will be short-term capital loss in the next year, and 9,000 of it will be long-term capital loss in the next year. Another thing that this example showed is that when you're looking at the excess of one type of capital gain or loss over another type, you can never go below zero. So it's not a pure subtraction in the sense that you could get a negative number. So if there's no excess, then that calculation gives you a zero for that excess amount. So if we take the same example with the long-term capital gain of 6,000, short-term capital gain of 4,000, long-term capital loss of 15,000, and short-term capital loss of 10,000, but we just add to it $10,000 of qualified dividend income, then we have exactly the same results with respect to the capital losses. The only difference is that the qualified dividend income is treated as net capital gain and adjusted net capital gain. So in addition to this being a limitation on losses problem, the taxpayer would have an adjusted net capital gain of $10,000. This has been Limitation on Capital Losses. Thanks for joining us as we break into tax. Don't forget to like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single video. <laughs>